As an iOS developer, you're no stranger to writing asynchronous and concurrent code in order to keep your app snappy and responsive and your users happy. We're talking about handling things like reacting to button taps, when the keyboard will be shown or hidden, downloading data, processing images to apply filters or do resizing or cropping, saving data to disk, and playing audio and video media. Some might say pulling it all off correctly might feel a bit like pulling a rabbit out of a hat. The iOS SDK provides various dissimilar APIs to do this work, including Notification Center, Key Value Coding and Observing, Grand Central Dispatch, and Operation Queues, and using closures and design patterns like Target Action and Delegation too. It's a bit of a soup of various APIs and patterns really. And this is really where RxSwift comes in. It allows you to write declarative, asynchronous, and concurrent code that embraces some great aspects of functional and reactive programming based on consistent patterns and operators, which, remember, adhere to the Rx standard shared across multiple languages and platforms. RxSwift helps to avoid the unexpected side effects by properly handling mutable state, and it enables writing code in a succinct and compositional way that is also much easier to reason about later than traditional approaches. It's that whole write once, read many times thing. And RxSwift APIs are designed to promote best practices like code isolation and decoupling and reusability. Oh, and Rx is multi-platform, so your skills are portable and cross-platform collaboration is greatly improved. So those are just some of the good reasons to learn RxSwift. Some reasons why it might not be a good time for you to learn RxSwift include that it lives up to its reputation of having a relatively steep learning curve in order to become an expert at it. It's a bit of a paradigm shift going from traditional to reactive programming. So if you're on a tight deadline, now's probably not the best time to tackle learning Rx Swift to incorporate it into your project. Rx Swift is actually a catch-all for Rx Swift and other Rx libraries like Rx Coco, Rx Data Sources, and more. Each one of these is a dependency for your project. Rx Swift and the most popular Rx community libraries are actively maintained and developed, but still. Rx Swift is definitely gaining in popularity and adoption, but you could still find plenty of development teams that aren't using it yet anyway. So, while it is not an all or nothing thing, you would not want to start using it in a project where all the other developers are not interested to learn it too, at least to some reasonable extent so that they could understand your code. Which brings me to my next point. Rx Swift gives you near superhuman powers as a developer. <laughs> Well, that's a bit of a stretch, but it does let you do some very powerful things with very little code. Use without understanding what you're doing, and you could get yourself into trouble. But that's why you're here, right? To get started on the best foot possible. And I guess one other point I want to make here is, it's not a panacea. It's a collection of some very fine tools, but they're definitely not the only ones you'll want in your toolbox. Now, all that being said, Rx Swift really ReactiveX overall, is based on two primary patterns, Observer and Iterator. You're going to create observable sequences and iterate over them in a reactive manner, a lot. You already know about sequences and collections and iterating over them. And you've probably also written your fair share of observable code, like subscribing to Notification Center or using key value coding and observing. The base type in Rx Swift is observable. It is a typed sequence that can emit zero or more elements, such as integers, over time to subscribers. Actually, an observable won't emit anything until it has at least one subscriber. Here's a marble diagram of an observable of integers, but these could also be taps or other recognized gestures too. Just remember that an observable is typed, so you wouldn't have an observable that emits integers and taps, for example. Well, I guess you could technically shoehorn something like that using protocols, but I can't think of a single reason for that craziness. So, every time an observable emits a new element, subscribers will have an opportunity to do something with that value or react to an event in some other way, such as to display an alert or something. That vertical bar represents the end of the line for that observable. It is terminated, and at that point, it cannot emit any more elements. So let me explain that a little better. An observable can emit a next event containing an element. And when the observable is done, it emits a completed event. This is considered normal termination. However, sometimes things can go wrong. And when that happens, an observable will emit an error event. This also terminates the observable. An observable can only emit one error event and it's done and can no longer emit any more events. 
just like when it emits a completed event. So to recap, observables can emit next events containing elements such as values or tap events, and observables are terminated when they emit an error event or a completed event. Want to see that in code? Of course you do. This is the implementation of event of element. It's an enum with three cases. Next, associating an element, error, associating an error, and completed, which doesn't associate any data. And with that little bit of theory, you, my friend, are ready to rock and roll with some RxSwift. On to the next video.